Some say that Jack the Ripper was England's first serial killer, but that's only because the other ones have been forgotten. In the 1860s, there was a pretty young woman named Mary Ann Cotton who couldn't bear anyone standing in her way. The fact that it had happened before Jack didn't make it any less shocking. And besides, this girl was worse. This is the story of Mary Ann Cotton. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan, with me as always is Les. How's it going? All good, man. All good. You sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, did you see the match the other night? The match? Which match? I don't know. Anyway, welcome. In. Yes, tonight's show is on Mary and Cotton. Now, Les, not heard of it. Not heard of this one. No, yeah. this one's completely new to me. Yeah, not many people have, but, you know, it's a good one, so we're going to get into it. But not before I read out some names of people who give us enough money to say their name. We have Hannah Blue Harrington, Amanda Champagne, Astralia Crowley, Amy Emmer and Jack Coleman, Lisa Dempsey, Marie T. Jensen, Casey the Cannibal, Becky Louise, Izzy from the Clink, Jules Henderson, Michelle Hudson, Alicia Llewellyn, Mandy Madden, Fire Pixie, Luke Mascara, Elle, Swissville, Krista... Verena Schmidt, Cookie Fenner, and Elizabeth Lee. Thank you all for giving money to us. I know it's like the world's gone to shit, really. And, um, you know, everyone's struggling. So the fact that you deem that your disposable income could come to us means a lot to us. Now, if anyone else wants to give us some money or, you know, just support us, you can do by going to www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark. Anything from a dollar all the way up to fifty dollars get you free stuff like mugs, stickers, t-shirts. Tell us what to do, you know, we'll do all that kind of shit. So yeah. Anyway, let's get into this one. So Mary Ann Cotton, born Robson, was born in 1832 to poor teenage parents who moved frequently so that her father, who was a minor, could find work. Now she was an exceptionally pretty child and almost a century later an old neighbour still remembered her fine dark eyes fine dark eyes dark eh? like a s- demon although her father fell down a mining shaft to his death when she was nine and her little sister died young Mary Ann would later characterise her early childhood as days of joy she so probably kicked him down there didn't she um, they were free of the obligations that would haunt her for the rest of her life marriage, motherhood and money now the days of joy ended for Mary Ann after her father died and when she had to help support the family she was a hard skilled worker as a teenager and she took jobs as a Sunday school teacher, a dressmaker and a maid for a wealthy family now this last gig gave Mary Ann a glimpse into the luxuries that money could buy and it changed her forever she was never rich as an adult, but she was always splurged on cleaning women. Now, in a world characterised by crushing poverty, unsanitary conditions and rampant sickness, she took great comfort in knowledge that every so often a maid would stop by the house, get down on her knees and scrub the floor for her. Now, Mary Ann was 19. She married a man named William Mowbray. Now, the ceremony took place 20 miles away from her home, possibly because Mary Ann was already pregnant and wanted to avoid a scandal. No family or friends were present. Now, this would be the first of many times Mary Ann stood at the altar pregnant and, except for her lover, entirely alone. Now, marriage seemed like a way out of poverty, but marriage to William Mowbray turned out to be just another form of destitution. Now, Mowbray took his teenage bride to a shanty town in the southwest of England, where Mary Ann gave birth to four or five children, all of whom died without being registered. Now, I say four or five here. Because at the end of her life, she couldn't actually remember the exact number of babies she'd had during that time. Shit. Sure. Mm. Now, when the Mowbrays finally moved back to the north, it was with one living daughter, Margaret Jane, who died soon after the move from scarlatina anginosa and exhaustion. Was that like scarlet fever? Sounds a lot like scarlet yeah. fever. Anyway, it's not hard, anyway, to imagine the psychological toll that this rough landscape, the seemingly inescapable poverty, and all the deaths of her children took on Mary Ann. Her first foray into motherhood had ended almost as soon as it began. She had taken a lover and ended up with five or six tiny graves. Perhaps this gave her the feeling that her children were disposable, ill-suited to the world, and barely worth remembering. 
Now, the couple, they continued to move on so that Mowbray could work one rough, poorly paid job after another. He eventually found a position on a steamer ship, so the two of them settled in a town near the coast, where they had three more children, Isabella, second Margaret Jane, and a baby John Robert, who died one year later of diarrhoea. That's a way to go, in it, Of diarrhoea. Mm, yeah, that's like, ah, oh, what's the... What's it? What's it called? Like, there's that. I know, yeah, but there's that term for it, isn't it? Like loads of uh, medieval people like died from it, shitting through the eye of a needle, uh, rusty water, rusty water, pebble dash in the toilet. I can go on. It's just there's another term for it, and I forget what it is. There we go. Anyway, so you may have noticed there, this a second Margaret Jane. Now, the reuse of the baby names does imply a certain dispensability of babies themselves. Now, the first Margaret Jane died in 1860, and the second was born in 1861. It's, weird. it's like Snowball on a Snowball too, isn't it? Like, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's very <laughs> like Snowball. When we were at school, we had a um, pet gerbil in our class called Ramboette. Uh, because we thought we called it Rambo, but then we found out it was a girl, so we called it Rambouette, and it died. And then we had another one. The teacher was like, "No, let's give it a name." We called it Rambouette too. Why not? Why not? We didn't give a shit. Anyway, Mowbray was away at sea for months at a time now, and soon enough, Mary Ann took up with a redhead miner named Joseph Natras, who lived in a neighbouring town. Ooh, sounds he sounds good, doesn't he? Natras. Now, Natris may have been the love of her twisted life, or just the closest thing to luxury she could find in that little town. Either way, she fell hard for him, and they would stay in touch for years. His arrival also coincided with a curious change in her personality. Before Natris, Mary Anna followed her husband from Shantytown to Shantytown. Now, after him, she began to take matters into her own hands. So how exactly did Mary Ann change from someone who watched people die around her to causing people to die around her. Now, perhaps her venture into murder was a way to move closer to Natris by getting rid of her previous identity as someone else's wife. Or maybe she couldn't take Mowbray's long ocean absences anymore and eventually snapped under the pressure of single motherhood. Maybe she just truly hated those around her and one day she simply thought to herself, enough's a fuck enough. Whatever spurred the sea of change in it, it stuck. Mary Ann quickly learned what arsenic could do to a human body and how easily it dissolved in hot tea. Oh, it's a, it's a fucker, it's arsenic. Did you know that um, at this time as well, you ever see them like places with like really green fucking wallpaper? Yeah. Like, well, um, a lot of that stuff was uh, laced with arsenic. That's how they got the green oh, pig- nice. pigmentation. So you had a lot of like instances in like Victorian uh, households where they get this dead fashionable fucking green wallpaper. Then all of a sudden, a few weeks later, dead. They're licking the wallpaper. Like the just it's like a just, wank just, Willy Wonka just, is. It is a shit like a shit Willy Wonka. But yeah, apparently it was because it was just like it was coming out of the wallpaper and they were inhaling arsenic and <laughs> fucking dying from it. Interesting fact. Anyway, Mowbray died in eighteen sixty five. Maybe innocently, maybe not. His cause of death was listed as typhus fever and diarrhea, which doesn't quite fit the symptoms of arsenic poisoning unless the doctor who filled out the death certificate confused typhus with typhoid. Now, typhoid fever did in fact look a lot like arsenic poisoning, and the doctors of the time used the term typhus and typhoid interchangeably because they're fucking thick. Regardless, his death was exceptionally convenient for Mary Ann. She collected a large sum of insurance money, scooped up her two young daughters, and moved to the town where Natris lived. Before long, the second Margaret Jane was dead of typhus fever. Just like her father, Mary Ann shipped Isabella off to live with her grandmother. Isabella would live to be nine, the oldest of Mary Ann's murdered children. I mean, the, like, what was the... Life expectancy in 1865, was it like 30 or not, something? Not high. Yeah, it was it like wasn't. 30. It was, 
not high at all. And, like, infant mortality at this time was, like, really, like, sort of bad. Mm. In particular, like... I mean, you got that, like, instance with, like, fucking Alistair Crowley, like, with one of his kids where they died because the bottle hadn't been properly sterilized. Weird, isn't it? Whilst they were in India. So uh, that's a that's a proper hot spot for well, was a yeah. proper hot spot spot for typhoid back then. Okay. Now just as Mary found herself child free and living in the same town as her red headed crush, she discovered a truth far more unpleasant than her death than death. Natris was already married. This put a wrench in her plans, didn't it? She approached it with the usual prosaic fashion. Instead of pursuing Natras further, she immediately moved back to her former town and took up nursing. She turned out to be a wonderful nurse with a knack for making her male patients feel extraordinarily comfortable. You know what's like dead interesting as well? The fact that they're on about these shanty towns like in the uh, south of England, you know, at this time. Now that's like prime fucking real estate, isn't it? Like... Fucking southern is though, isn't it? Like on the coast, on 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 the south coast, like fucking. I know, uh, yeah. That expensive there, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? It's nice though. Anyway, one of her patients was apparently well proportioned and muscular man named George Ward, and he was totally smitten. Ward, that's a muscular man's name, yeah, isn't is it? it? George Ward, George Ward. Ward. So is those guns, George. He's got a gun head like a bowling ball, as George Ward. Now, he had totally smitten by the arrival of this pretty new worker. One minute he was groaning in his sick bed, next thing he was being nursed to health by an angel. Now, he proposed almost immediately. Again, no one from Mary Ann's family attended the service, which was quick and kind of depressing. The witness on the marriage certificate was the groom from the wedding right before theirs. It's like a Vegas thing, isn't it? Yeah, very. <laughs> now, during her brief marriage toward Mary Ann never got pregnant. Now, this was unusual for her, and some biographers wondered if it meant Ward was disappointing in bed. I mean, he was muscular, wasn't he? He was muscular. Virile. I don't know. Maybe he might, he might have been taking Victorian steroids, so he's like, dick was like that big. Anyway, this sort of speculation is often flung around at female serial killers all the time, implying that their dark deed need to kill is linked to a ravenous sexual appetite and that one can be exchanged for another. Right? When Mary um, didn't get a kick from Ward in the bedroom, she got a kick from poisoning him. But Ward was certainly disappointing in some way or another because he died after a mere 15 months of marriage, suffering from the classic symptoms of arsenic poisoning, diarrhoea, stomach pains and a tingling in his hands and feet. Now, with with the second husband um, out of the way and the majority of her children dead, Mary Ann continued this new fatal hustle. She moved again and applied for work as the housekeeper for a wealthy father of five. His name was James Robinson. His young wife had recently died and he was everything Mary Ann was looking for in a man. She moved into the Robinson home before Christmas of 1866 and a week after her arrival, the youngest Robinson child was dead. Though, with only 24 hours between the first sign of sickness and the fatal convulsion. Mary Ann already had her eye on Robinson, and now she was clearing the playing field of all other distractions. Now, the death of the child didn't dampen James Robinson's passions, though, and Mary Ann was pregnant by early March. But then her mother got sick, and Mary Ann was called away to nurse her. Perhaps she resented the interruption because nine days later, despite Mary Ann's supposed skill as a nurse, the mother lay six feet underground. But she was an angel, yeah. She was an angel. I mean, angel of death. Angel, angel of death. The neighbours were suspicious. Mary Ann had not only loudly predicted the death of her mother a few days before her passing, but then had proceeded to rummage through her dead mother's possessions in a way that neighbours found tactless and overeager. <laughs> so, like, what are you looking for? Stop she was rummaging sound. around like a fucking badger. It's fucking neighbours for you, ain't it? Just like, just see her rummaging around with her talons. Oh, like, tactless is what tactless. she is. Yeah, thought she might be a good nurse, and then she died. Yeah, she's a nurse. She come in, she was like, I don't think my mum's got long left. That's not her being tactless or pronouncing it that. That's her being, I'm medically trained. She's on her way out. Anyway, still Mary Ann ignored their whispering, grabbed her daughter Isabella and ran back to Robinson. April 1867 was a bad month for the Robinson household. 
Within the span of ten days, three of the children were rolling about in bed, foaming at the mouth and vomiting compulsively. Nine-year-old Isabella, the last Mowbray, died of gastric fever. Six-year-old James Robinson died of continued fever. His eight-year-old sister Elizabeth died of gastric fever. All of these natural causes were easy cover-ups for arsenic poisoning. The fact that the deaths came in such quick succession shows us how heavy-handed Mary Ann could be with the poison and how impatient she was with the requirements of quasi-step motherhood. But also shows us just how frequently children died back in those days. Even this triple death didn't make anyone suspicious. You're just like, meh. And like, when kids die. Now, James Robinson married his ch- children's murderer in the solitary ceremony sometime during August 1867. The first daughter was born that November and she was dead of convulsions within months. Now, Mary Ann used pregnancy as a way to secure marriage, but she wasn't especially interested in raising the children. Now, Robinson was solidly in denial by this point. Later, he would admit that at the time, he would not let his mind dwell on some thoughts that he dare not. Oh, that's a typical uh, Victorian sort of toxic masculinity yeah, going just like, on here. I'll just ignore all these facts. I'll just ignore all these like dark like feelings that I'm feeling, and uh, I'll just I'll just so, sideline yeah, them, push them to one way. Boy. Now, by 1869, Robinson and Mary Ann had another child together, baby George, and they were beginning to argue fiercely about money. Robinson was learning that Mary Ann had a habit of minor financial deceptions. Minor financial deceptions. <laughs> she ran up little debts. She kept money she claimed to have spent, and she enlisted his last surviving son to pawn clothes for her. They fought about the latter incident furiously, and Mary Ann grew so upset that she ran away, taking baby George with her. While she was gone, Robinson boarded up the house and moved in with his sister. Later, in a plaintive letter, Mary Ann would spin the action as betrayal on his part. I left the house for a few days. I did not wish to part from him. When I returned, there was no home for me. What a chum. I know, yeah, it's sort of like... Oh, she's run off. I'm going to board up my house and move in with my sister. <laughs> Proper simp behaviour. <laughs> now, after a few months away, Mary Ann sashayed back into town with baby George and dropped him off at a friend's house in order to mail a letter. Now, she never returned for the child, ever. Eventually, George was reunited with his father. Mary Ann must have realised that she was never going to get back together with Robinson, who certainly should have suspected by this point that he married to an insatiable killer, and so she was freeing her hands for her next project. Now, at 37, Mary Ann worked and wandered. She had three of her husband and children for the third time in her life. A rumour had it that she moved in with a lusty sailor and then stole all his wealth when a he was away. A lusty sailor? Yeah, she stole all his wealth while he was away at sea. Sounds like it, William Hope fucking Hodgson. <laughs> but it wasn't long before she jumped back into the domestic fray. The home was, after all, her battleground, her wrestling mat, the place where she did her best and bloodiest work. She was the dark underbelly of the Victorian era's feminine ideal. The idea that nothing was sweeter, nothing was purer than a good woman at home. Now, Mary Ann began to correspond with an acquaintance from her younger days, a wealthy spinster named Margaret Cotton. Margaret had a brother, Frederick Cotton, who was a widower with two sons and, like Robinson before him, desperately needed a housekeeper. Poor Margaret th- probably thought that she was doing her brother a favour by sending over the qualified and charming Mary Ann, but she had no idea what horrors Mary Ann was about to bring down on the entire Cotton family. So Mary Ann became Frederick Cotton's housekeeper at the beginning of 1870, and four weeks later his loving sister Margaret was dead. Now, Margaret's money went straight to her brother, and her brother went straight to Mary Ann, who was soon pregnant. She married Cotton in the autumn, despite the fact that she was still technically married to her previous husband. Later, this would be the only crime she'd confessed to, bigamy. After a few weeks, um, a few weeks after the wedding, she took life insurance out on his sons. In 1871, the new fiveson moved to West Auckland. Mary Ann, Frederick Cotton and his sons, Frederick Jr. and Charles Edward, and the new baby, Robert Robson. In West Auckland, Cotton found work as a hewer at a coal mine, but the move also profited Mary Ann, because conveniently enough, they moved onto the same street as a certain red-headed miner from her past. Well, just, just, just to catch up, West Auckland, is this in the UK? Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, Joseph Datras was no longer married, and Mary Ann had no compunctions about getting rid of her latest husband. She'd buried men before, so it's easy for her. 
Now, she'd always been a quick colour relying on the rea- realities of poor hygiene, the misdiagnosis of doctors and the high rate of infant mortality in Britain's tiny towers to explain the fact that death followed her wherever she went. But now she was getting even more reckless. She no longer had time to stay married for a few years or to let her children celebrate just one last birthday before she snuffed them out. Frederick Cotton died quickly and just as quickly in his trust moved in with her and the children as a lodger. Now, Mary Ann surely intended to marry an actress when she killed Cotton. Now, murder and remarriage had been a, a MO up until this point, and for a while, marrying Natras must have seemed like the final step to achieving the life that she wanted. Natras excited her. He represented love and rash adventure, and he may have unknowingly inspired her to become a killer. But Mary Ann wanted more than just love. She craved money too, and before she could marry Natras, she met a new man. He was richer than Natras, and at this point, Mary Ann's life, that was everything. The new man was a tax collector, and he went by the name of Quick Manning. <laughs> He'd been suffering from smallpox when he met Mary Ann, who was still taking on nursing jobs, and she charmed him all the way the way she charmed all the patients. Now, meanwhile, the town's sympathy for Mary Ann was beginning to drain away. They had felt terrible for her when she arrived in town and almost immediately became a widow with three tiny children to care for. But when Natras moved in with her, people started growing suspicious and her seduction of Quick Manning really put everyone on edge. Worse, it was pretty obvious to neighbours that Mary Ann was mistreating the cotton children. The poor kids looked like they were starving. When a neighbour gently brought it to Mary Ann's attention, she responded that the cotton kids were weak-stomached and didn't have much of an appetite. The reality was that Mary Ann had always had a low tolerance for children of any sort, whether they were hers or not, and she never needed to clear the way um, and she needed to clear the way for quick manning. So she killed Frederick Cotton Jr. with gastric fever. Gastric fever. Okay. Poisoned her baby Robert Robson, convulsions and teething. Teething. Yes. Um so um believe it or not, teeth used to be a major like fucking killer. Um, this is why a lot of people would have actually had like their teeth removed and just had like false teeth put in around this time because they're very susceptible to like infection oh, right. and other things. In fact, like again, going back to medieval time, you, you might have seen like carvings. Um, it's dead interesting. They're like made from ivory, but they're like sort of these teeth that you can like pull open like that. And they've got carvings. You can get pictures. We'll put one on screen. <clears throat> like you're making find fucking shit. work for me. I'll send you a picture. But it's got like uh, pictures of worms and demons and like hellish like sort of landscapes like carved within the tooth. And that's so yeah. Uh, teething definitely and bad teeth definitely a fucking uh, killer back in them days. Make sure it's a PNG and not a JPEG. Will do. Anyway, yeah, so convulsions and teething killed Robert Robson and began to, he, and she began to poison Natras himself with typhoid fever. All within 20 days of each other, a neighbour girl came by to help nurse the sick children and noticed the baby was barely breathing, staring off into space with glazed, unmoving eyes. He's dying, said the girl. Who shall I fetch? Mary Ann responded, Nobody. Now Joseph, Nobody. <laughs> now, Joseph Natras knew that Mary Ann was poisoning him, but by that point, there was nothing he could do. He was too close to death, and every so often, his body would shake with a par- um, paroxysm that caused him to clench his hands, grit his teeth, draw up his legs, while his eyes rolled back in his head until only the whites were showing. Another neighbour who stopped by to help notice there was something unnatural about his illness. I saw him have fit. He was very twisted up and seemed in great agony, he did, she reported. He said, it is no fever that I have. Now, as Natras convulsed, the tiny corpse of Robert Robson lay stiffly nearby. The baby had died four days earlier, but Mary Ann was waiting for Natras to perish so she could bury them at the same time. Saving on the funeral expenses. Of course, yeah. Just, uh, just stack them up like Jenga. Now, once all that messy business was over, Mary Ann got pregnant. Quick Manning was the father, and she was all primed to marry him. But there was just one final problem standing in her way. Her stepson, Charles Edward, the last of the Cotton Boys. Now, she resented everything about him, but she must have cursed herself for leaving one kid alive for this long. 
Neighbours noticed how cruelly she treated little Charles, beating his ears, pulling at his hair, and on Easter, throwing his one trap tiny treat, an orange, into the fire. Fuck your orange. <laughs> anyway, one afternoon, a local grocer and druggist named Thomas Riley stopped by Mary Ann's... Druggist? Th- yeah. They did everything then, didn't they? Gross. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause grocer, just... druggist, barber, dentist. Oh. So, at Mary Ann's house, he asked if she could nurse another smallpox patient. As they chatted, Mary Ann kept bringing the conversation back to Charles Edward and how much of a burden he was, how his responsibility weighed on him. Now, Charles Edward cowered in the corner of the room listening. Mary Ann uh, batted her eyes and asked Riley if he could possibly put the child into a workhouse. He said no. Now, unfazed, Mary Ann replies, Perhaps it won't matter, as I won't be troubled too long. He'll go like all the rest of the Cotton family. Do you want to, mm. want to dial it down a bit there? Yeah. Maybe? Now, six days later, Riley was walking past Mary Ann's house and caught sight of her in the doorway, openly distraught. She told him that Charles Edward was dead. And she begged him to come inside and look at the body. Now, inviting people in to witness her victims had always been one of her tricks. She was unperturbed by doctors and encouraged them to stop by and recommend cures for the typhoid fever and convulsions. Her patients always seemed to be suffering. This was one of the ways she avoided detection. Now, she played the bereaved nurse, the mother and wife. And by inviting Riley to come into the house and witness the corpse, she was placing a bet on herself. That Riley would read the death of the sickly starving child as natural, inevitable, even, and he wouldn't dream of accusing her at all. But with his death and her casual remark about the rest of the Cotton family, Mary Ann had gone too far. Riley was certain that she'd murdered her tiny stepson. He refused to look at the body and instead went straight to the police. Fucking knock. No, right. Grass. Anyway, the NQS was held and Charles Edward's poor little body was laid out on a table. The post-mortem was a sloppy one because the boy's death was ruled natural. Still, the doctor must have had his suspicions because he was careful to preserve some of Charles Edward's viscera, which he burned, buried in jars in his own yard. Now, Mary Ann went on her way, but her days of freedom were numbered. The town gossips and local papers had already picked up on Riley's suspicions, and people eventually convinced the doctor to investigate Charles Edward's body again. So the doctor dug up the jars, analysed their contents using a more systematic technique, and found arsenic in everything. He ran to the police station at midnight, and Mary Ann was arrested the next day. Now, initially, she was only accused of the murder of Charles Edward, but soon enough, the charges expanded to include the murder of Joseph Natras, Frederick Cotton Jr., and the baby Robert Robson. Now, that's a rubbish name. That's <laughs> shit, <isn't> it? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry for the small child who's died in his mum poisoning, but fucking fuck Robert yeah, Robson. Robson. Jesus. Their bodies were exhumed and tested, and huge amounts of arsenic were found in all three. Police tried to exhume Frederick Cotton Sr., but in a bizarre twist, they couldn't find his body anywhere, despite digging up several graves in the process. Ooh. Probably the ghost of Birkenhair. Anyway, Mary Ann gave birth to Quickman's child in prison, and during her trial, she would breastfeed the baby in front of the court, refusing to talk. It's a fucking power move. It is. is. Now, it? like... it's a savvy move working their jury sympathies by tapping into Victorian ideals of femininity. Now, the era's perfect woman was captivated in all the stifling glory in the 1854 narrative poem, The Angel in the House, which gushed, For she's so simply, subtly sweet, my deepest rapture does her wrong. How could this silent breastfeeding woman be capable of murder? Reporters watched her in the courtroom, noticing her delicate and prepossessing beauty, which was deliberately obscured in the portraits of her that ran next to the articles. Fucking put pictures of a rat munter on there. Now, her defence latched onto the fact that no arsenic had actually been discovered in the house at the time of Charles Edward's death. They argued that the boy had been accidentally poisoned by arsenic fumes rising off the green wallpaper in his bedroom and by the flakes of the arsenic and what soft soap. What did I say? What did I say? Yeah, the arsenic and soft soap mixture she used to clean the house. And that was the thing. So, like, arsenic, like... And I know that may sound bizarre to our listeners, but, like, arsenic was, like, a big thing 
Uh, in fact, I watched this thing the other day about this woman uh, from Liverpool who was accused of murdering a husband via arsenic, but it was found that she was like treating herself like skin conditions uh, with arsenic because it was believed it was like soap with arsenic in it and stuff at this time was like freely sort of advertised as a good way of getting rid of skin blemishes and spots and I things mean, like what? that. I mean, it fucking would, along with other things. But, yeah, so arsenic soap was a thing. The prosecution brought in a prestigious doctor to discount this theory off. Now, there was simply too much poison in the corpses, the doctor said. Joseph Natras's body, for example, contained four times the amount of arsenic necessary to kill a man. Now, (sighs) the only time that Mary Ann broke down was when the defence gave a melodramatic speech about the implausibility of a mother killing her own child. A mother nursing her baby, seeing its pretty smiles while she knew she had given it arsenic, they wailed, making its limbs writhe and look into her face, wanting support and protection. How could anyone simply, subtly sweet Victorian mother possibly be accused of such horrors? At this point in the proceedings, Mary Ann started to cry. Sympathetic onlookers may have interpreted, interpreted her crying as an agreement with the defence. Yes, exactly. I could never do that to a baby. Really, though, the defence was describing exactly what Mary Ann had done numerous times to numerous babies. She knew all about the ways that pretty smiles could turn into writhing and vomit and foaming at the mouth. Ultimately, Mary Ann was convicted of the, the awful crime of murder for the death of Charles Edward. You seem to have given way to the most awful of all delusions, said the judge that you could carry out your wicked designs without detection. Now, she blanched as she heard his sentence read out aloud, death by hanging. Now, the hangman chosen to execute Mary Ann Cotton was a controversial figure with several botched executions under his belt. Oh, he's one of these. Now, he preferred to use the short drop from the platform, which occasionally had unpleasant side effect of not breaking the prisoner's neck. Now, when this happened, the hangman would have to press down on the shoulders of the dying as they strangled slowly, spinning at the end of the rope. During her final days, Mary Ann wrote frantic letters to family and friends, asking them to petition for a reprieve. Now, she had no idea what was going on with her trial, and at one point she wrote that the lawyer from the prosecution would be there to defend me. There to defend me. Now, she continued to insist that she was innocent, and her letters took on a martyred, incredulous tone as she complained about the lies that had been told about me. She also begged her one surviving husband, James Robinson, to visit her and bring baby George. He was like, nah, fuck that shit. (laughs) Now, she did make one final maternal gesture, though, when she arranged for her last child to be adopted. But even this was tinged with malice. Apparently, days earlier, she had been caught rubbing its gums with soap, thinking that if her baby grew ill, her might life be spared until its recovery. You're just doubling down there, yeah. Mary, aren't you, a little bit? Like... Now, Mary Han had been a mother for now exactly half her life. Whether she'd lied to or not, her existence up to this point is largely defined by being secretly pregnant or publicly pregnant or recently pregnant or pregnant with another man's child. Now, seduction, and by extension pregnancy, had been one of her most faithful weapons. The other was a nefarious white powder available to any pharmacy. Now, Mary Ann had used her fertility to control the rise and fall of her life. Giving this away, this last baby, was a powerful sign that everything, the seduction, the marriage, the birthing, and the poison, was very, very much over. Now, was Mary Ann a sociopath? Was she addicted to the rush of killing the innocents? Was she a capitalist, climbing the social ladder of husbands in a desperate attempt to gain some autonomy? Was she clearly striving for something, but it's unclear what she wanted most? Was it money? Freedom? Was it other people's pain? Now, she saw marriage and motherhood as a form of imprisonment, one that she desperately wanted to break free from, but also as a form of salvation. And so her methods were cyclical to the point of madness. She killed one husband only to marry the next. She poisoned one child only soon to become pregnant with another. Now, what did she expect to happen with that next husband and that next baby? Was she expecting something to kick in deep inside her? The final sense of satisfaction, comfort and maternal instinct, or love? 
No matter how many horrors she inflicted on other people, nothing ever really changed for her. And so she escaped the ho- uh, she never escaped her hall of mirrors, forced to relive her own sordid history time and time again. It's a positive feedback loop, isn't it? Yeah. Like, that's what it is. Like, fucking, um, everybody will be watching this now, but like you, isn't it? That's what Joe does on you. Oh, I thought you meant me. No, no, like, no, 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 no. So, like, the fuck are you talking what about, What the Wes? fuck have I done? Sorry, sorry, Jan. <laughs> but no, it's like that, isn't it? It's like you, like the constant, like, fucking. Yeah. It is. It's like an Ouroboros eating its own tail. Now, Mary Ann walked the four minutes from her cell to the scaffold on March 24th, 1873. She was 40 years old, wearing a black and white check shawl that disguised the fact that her arms were bound to the sides with a belt. Those types of shawls were considered fashionable in surrounding towns, but after Mary Ann was photographed in them, the trend quickly died off. She's just, just by doing that, what a dickhead move. I consider this the worst of her crimes. Because you think... How many, like, fucking dressmakers that is fucked over? You just change it, though. It's only a pattern, isn't it? I mean, it's only a pattern. It's not like you say like, it's only a it's pattern. It's not like they were like, oh, she's wearing clothes. Well, that's yeah, but it, that's, I'm getting around Yeah, but that's fashionable as fuck, that is. And now they're just like, right, I can't, I'm just a fucking humble dressmaker with my patterns. How am I going to, like, fucking instill a new pattern? I'm not from fucking Paris. Change the white to red. Yeah. Could work. But you don't see that in the photographs because they're all fucking sepia in these days. I know. Anyway, a crowd of people gathered outside the jail to catch a glimpse of it. Journalists inside wrote that she looked like a doomed wretch, sobbing hysterically as she shuffled towards. On the scaffold, she shuddered when the rope went around her neck. Her last words were, Lord, have mercy on my soul. And then the ground dropped from under her feet. It took her three minutes to die and the executioner had to steady her twitching body with his own hands. Was this that dickhead executioner? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the announcement of her execution may dispel a popular idea, long too prevalent to the effect that the female assassin, however frightful her wickedness, may generally hope for a reprieve in consideration of her sex, ran the Burnley advertiser a few days later. But the atrocities of Mary Ann Cotton put her beyond the pale of human mercy, for unless she was fearfully maligned, no more hideous monster ever breathed on earth. Now, of course, England had no idea that in 15 years that their most famous serial killer would start disemboweling hookers in the poorest parts of London. He would then be the most hideous monster to ever breathe on Earth and could capture the attention of the press in a way that Mary Ann Cotton never did. And we managed to top that generations, generations later. I did say that, as you said, he. That's probably why they did it, because sexism. Anyway... About a week after she died, a moralising play called The Life and Death of Mary Ann Cotton opened. For a while, children sang songs about her on the street. Mary Ann Cotton, she's dead and she's rotten, lying in bed with her eyes wide open. It's a bit shit, really, isn't it? I don't know, that's, like, creepy. Imagine it's sung by, like, fucking kids. That was a kid. Did you not hear him? Oh, I'm from fucking London, I am. Shine your bitch, your tiny chimp. Yeah, but soon after she was forgotten and the cycle of birth and death went on as before in the little towns of England. And thus ends the tale of Mary Ann Cotton. Now, Les, she was fucking vicious, wasn't she? Yeah. And when I said, like, she was worse than Jack the Ripper, she was in many ways because she's there fucking killing children, her own children, other people's children, and just moving on. Now, I think we can safely say there's something wrong with it. But what is it? Definitely. I mean, there's definitely... I I personally say there's a degree of sociopathy going on there. I mean, I think there's there's maybe even a degree of, like, maybe her um, motivation was that she was socially climbing. But then if you look at, like, the men she was, like, with, there's Mm -hmm. not really... Not really, no. Not a real social climbing thing. Um... Personally, I think it's interesting because she did a similar thing to uh, the pirate and Bonnie. Mm. You heard of the pirate and because yeah. she did that, didn't she? Like when yeah. she was going to go to the gallows, like she was like they were like her and the other one. Unfortunately, I forget the other one's name. I can't remember right now. But it was kind of like, oh no, we're both pregnant, so 
save us from exactly. the news. And didn't Anne Bonnie get like fucking bailed out? I think she like... did, yeah. But yeah, so um, that was the story of Marianne Cotton. Um, let us know what you think. Not many people have heard of her, um, but I really like. I really it's interested. Fascinating, in it. That yeah, because was... I'm really interested in it. Um, like little known serial killers, and obviously little known female serial killers, especially mm-hmm. in England, right before Jack yeah. the Ripper. So you know what I mean. People like you've all heard of Jack the Ripper. Any of you heard of Mary Ann Cotton? Let me know what you think of it. Please remember, you've got to like, share, and subscribe these videos um, because it really helps us out. Um, we're on like ten thousand seven hundred or something. You know, it'd be cool if we could get to eleven thousand by the end of the year. Um, we never thought we'd get to a thousand. So no, that's no, that's cool as fuck. Um, but yeah, reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. Email us at enterthedarkpodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to see us do more of this stuff, you can help us out by do, by chucking us a few shekels um, by going to www.patreon.com forward slash enterthedark. Anything from a dollar all the way up to $50. Um, you get free stuff. You get mugs, t-shirts, stickers. You can tell us what to do. Do loads of stuff. And yeah, yeah. Um, That'd be cool. And um, we're going to have some people coming on as guests soon to help us do these stories. We're going to be doing your favourite one soon. Don't say the name of it, but I we're going to be wait. doing that one soon. And um, we're going to be doing some cool ones. And yeah, so it's going to be good. But yeah, as for now, I've been Jan. He's been Les. I'm touching your chest. Take care. Bye bye. Oh, my nipple hurts. That's not even my nipple. That was a hair, though, and it did hurt. (laughs)